you know, people worry, they hear me singing these songs, they say, he's not singing the words that are in the hymnal. <laughs> and that's true, because some contemporary editors changed them. I've been singing these things for 50 years. I'm singing the right words. <laughs> Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1. We're continuing studying the book of Ephesians verse by verse, and we're going to begin at uh, verse uh, 15 this morning, and we'll read down to verse 23. Uh, as you know, uh, verses uh, 3 through uh, 14 in your Bible constitute one 202-word sentence in the original Greek. Uh, and that took us five weeks. So I'm really pleased to announce that everything you're going to read this morning is the second sentence in the book of Ephesians. <laughs> 169 words in this sentence. So you remember sentence diagramming in school, right? It's one idea. Lots of modifiers, this and that. It's one idea. Uh, so we're going to look at this one idea and concentrate on it. I promise not to take five weeks on the second sentence. So. Verse 15, for this reason, what reason is that? Uh, for the reason that in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That's verse 11. For this reason is referring back. That is the antecedent. For that reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, he's speaking to the church at Ephesus, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And now he's going to describe how it is that he's praying for the church at Ephesus. Remember, Paul is praying from a Roman jail at this time. And so this is what he prays, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. So there you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Christianity is, without compromise, a Trinitarian faith. The God of the Bible is a Trinitarian God. We don't defend any other God. We don't preach any other God. It's not God in general. It's not God in some sort of, you know, loose way. We are saying that the only God is the creator God of the Bible who has revealed himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. And what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Pay attention to that, because uh, a lot of Christians don't understand the big picture, the meta-narrative. What is the Bible all about? Remember this description, that the saints of God, you the church, are his inheritance. The Father gives the people of God, the church of Christ, to the Son as an inheritance for his life, death, and resurrection. We'll get to that uh, more thoroughly. And verse 19, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? According, how do we believe? According to the working of his great might. How is it you believe? You believe according to the working of his great might. Now you either believe that verse or you don't, but that's how you believe. You believe according to the working of his great might. Uh, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of the Lord. And we'll pay attention particularly this morning to verses 15 uh, through 19. Uh, maybe some of you remember this kind of music. Do you remember music that had brass in it? Blood, sweat, and tears. Chicago. Ides of March. Earth, wind, and fire. You know, back when music was music. Well, you know, I grew up as a trumpet player, and 
it was the blessing of God and his providence that at the time that I was playing a lot, that was the popular music of the day. So if you were going to be a top 40 band and you were going to play in some club here in Maine along the coast in the summer, uh, you had to have brass players. You couldn't have learned the guitar in your garage. You had to read music. You had to be able to play all that stuff. So I did. And I played every one of those tunes. Uh, and the reason that it was unique uh, for me uh, was that I had uh, the great fortune of uh, having my trumpet player be Chuck, uh, teacher being Chuck Winfield from Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Do you know he lived in Maine? He did, I'll tell you a little story. I know you hate him, don't you? So, uh, you know, in, in the early 70s, uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears made that hit album with Spinning Wheel on it and God Bless the Child and Go Down Gambling and You've Made Me So Very Happy. Do you remember these tunes? Yeah. Oh, this is so good. <laughs> we are going to get along just fine. Uh, there were two trumpet players in that band, uh, Lou Soloff, uh, who's still a New York uh, uh, trumpet player. Uh, and uh, Chuck Winfield. They both had uh, attended Juilliard uh, doing their undergraduate and graduate degrees. Uh, and uh, uh, when Chuck Winfield uh, was recruited for that band, it was just a, a rehearsal band in New York, and he placed, uh, replaced a great trumpet player named Randy Becker. Do you know who Randy Becker is, the jazz trumpet player? Oh, see, I've just lost you. Well, anyway, <laughs> back to Chuck. So Chuck had uh, an interesting time. They won Grammy Awards. They played all of the words. You can probably still sing those songs. And then uh, Chuck became a junkie. Uh, and, uh, you know, the high party life was tough on him. And uh, finally, uh, he got clean and sober. And the way he did that uh, was uh, through the Jehovah's Witness. Uh, and the Jehovah's Witness uh, do not allow you to play in bars. Uh, I don't think you can drink coffee. I mean, you can't do much of anything as a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> no Christmas, no nothing. Uh, so Chuck had the graduate degrees, and they had started uh, here at the University of Maine at Augusta, a jazz program back when I was a kid. It was led by Willie Maiden, who was uh, the uh, arranger on the Stan Kenton Band. Uh, and they had all kinds of great jazz guys right here in Augusta, Maine, begin that program. They wanted to have kind of a Berkeley College of Music, you know, north of Boston. And so Chuck Winfield came up uh, to live in Augusta, Maine, because it was safe and he could stay clean and sober. And I was in high school, and he became my trumpet teacher. And that was great for me, uh, a little bit. Because I'd go, and I'd get an hour lesson, and then an hour recruitment on how I should be a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> and you can see how that worked out. <laughs> now, the good news is, uh, Chuck uh, would not step foot in the places that I would. <laughs> And so, because I knew him, I got all kinds of jobs. It was one of those, it's who you know kind of things, right? It's who you know. Uh, but it's not just who you know. You don't uh, often connect this, but who you know is often connected to what you know. Because you could know Chuck Winfield, but if you couldn't play trumpet, he wasn't going to refer you. It's what you know, too. And that's exactly what's going on uh, in this passage. Uh, Paul has just written a very long sentence describing who God is. And you can summarize that within uh, verse 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. There's the description of God that Paul wants to communicate to the church at Ephesus. What kind of God is he? He's the kind that works all things according to the purpose and the counsel of his own will. He is that kind of God. And so what Paul is now going to say is you need to increase something in your life. And what is it that you need to increase in verse 17? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. In other words, the problem behind your problem is you don't really know God at all. You have to rely on the Spirit of God 
to reveal himself to you, to increase your knowledge, to give you a greater awareness of who he is. It's not just who you know, it's what you know. And the God of the Bible isn't asking you through some process of self-discovery and uh, human investigation to arrive at some sort of independent conclusion as to who he is. He's saying, I created you, you didn't create me, and you don't get to create me. And since I created you, I'm going to reveal to you through the Spirit of God who I am so that you'll have an increased knowledge of who I am. So you'll actually know me, that you won't guess at it, that you won't speculate about it. You know, if I lied, to, remember when Jay Leno used to go out and interview people on the street and ask them the most basic questions, proving once and for all that our educational system is completely collapsed. <laughs> people didn't know anything about anything. And you could do the same thing right now. You could walk up and down Waterville with a microphone and a camera and ask people who God is and you get a thousand different answers. A thousand different answers. And God doesn't leave you to private speculation. He leaves you to a very public written record in his text. And he says, this is who I am. This is how you get to know me. And so Paul is going to say that the real problem behind your problem is that you need an, an expanded awareness of who God is. I mean, it doesn't matter what you consider the problem to be. And I, I, you know I don't preach politics, but if I did, I could spend an hour here on some problems, couldn't I? And you might say, oh, I know what the problem is. It might be this particular policy, or it might be that particular policy, or it might be this particular interest group. And what Paul is saying is none of those are the problem. The problem behind every one of your problems is an increased awareness of who God really is. Who is he? How does he interact with his creation? How through his spirit does he lead you and guide you? What is it that he is asking from you? And this is why he begins there, because later on in his letter, he's going to talk about all uh, kinds of things. He's going to talk about the lack of unity in the church. Uh, he's going uh, to talk about sexuality. He's going to talk about marriage. He's going to talk about work life. He's going to talk about spiritual warfare. And he's not going to talk about that independent of the fact that those problems aren't the real problem. The problem behind the problem is an increased awareness of who the God of the Bible really is. And so he prays in such a way, and he writes down that prayer from a Roman jail, so the church at Ephesus will have an understanding, a clear understanding of who God actually is. And you can see here that this knowledge of God brings a particular kind of release for that church. Because it's easy if you don't understand who God is and you're sort of just making it up as you go and you're sort of just darting from one problem to another and finding one failed solution after another. Uh, it's easy to get frustrated and it leads to this sort of intellectual and spiritual bondage in your life. You don't know where to go next. You seem to be all tied up. But it gives you a release knowing who God is. And he says here that there are three things in, uh, about God that you need to know. And they are in verses 18 and 19. First he prays that you will know the hope to which he has called you. That's number one. The second thing he says, he wants you to know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And the third thing he prays is that you will begin to understand the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us. Those are the three things about God that we fail to recognize, understand how they work in our lives, and understand how God is operating in a world that looks a lot, some days, as if he has vacated the premises. So let's kind of take a look at these three things and what they mean. First of all, the knowledge of God brings a release from verse 18 from emptiness. Why do I say emptiness? What we don't understand is that God has not called us to be really cool or different. He hasn't called us to be little cultural warriors. He hasn't called you to be so saturated in the moment that you forget eternity. What he has called you to is something in particular. And it is what? It is the hope to which he has called you. In other words, he 
is asking you to understand that the God of eternity is primarily, not repeating myself here, intentionally redundant. The God of eternity is an eternal God with an eternal perspective. And that calling is a calling to hope not to get mired down in the quicksand of the present moment. It's to keep your eyes fixed on the future. And what does that require? That requires a certain kind of God that can do what? Who has, uh, who are called according to the purpose of him, who does something, who works things, uh, all things according to the counsel of his will. You can't have a God uh, who's a God at all if he doesn't work all things according to the counsel of his will. If there's no God, what else is left? You're sitting on it. It's matter. It's molecules in motion. That's all there is. There's either a God or there isn't. There's no middle ground to that. There is or there isn't a God. And the question is, if there isn't a God, and the world truly exists all on its own, spontaneous combu uh, combusted out of nothing, then of course you have no hope and purpose. Your life is meaningless. You would have to conclude that. And if you thought you had hope, you would have to come and borrow it from Christianity to get it. You're stealing from our bank. If there's no God, you don't get hope. What you get is death. Materialism. You get nothing. You get molecules. That's all you got. But that's not what you want, is it? Something in your heart wants something more. And that's what it's talking about. That hope that he's called you to is a hope that changes you. It gives you a different current perspective on life. You look at things differently because you know that the future is an ordained future. It has a purpose to it. That God is planning a future for his people and for uh, his creation. And that future has a predictability to it. If there's no God, life is completely unpredictable and without meaning. It requires a God. The precondition that you have meaning and hope is that there is a God in the first place. Because if there is no God, there is no meaning and there's no hope. You just have to manufacture that. Maybe you can come up with some temporary hope. And maybe you can come up with some temporary meaning. But you'll keep changing your mind about what means something. No, you need a God who does what? Who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That is the precondition of hope. That you have an eternal, loving, gracious God who has a planned purpose for his creation. And we participate in that. And certainly we don't participate in it in some sort of way where we're omniscient like God as if we know everything. We don't. We see through a glass darkly, the Bible says now. We don't have all the answers now. But we can live in such a way that we have a hopeful perspective, knowing that a faithful, loving, merciful God has this under control, even in the worst of moments. And why do we know that? That is the message of the cross that we're going to celebrate this morning. It looked like the Roman armies and Satan had won when Jesus is on the cross. It's over. There's nothing left. This is the worst kind of condition. Certainly, we can't come back from this. We're not going to win this game. We're too far down. That was Friday. But Sunday was coming. And because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the very thing that looked for all the world as if God would be defeated is the very thing. It's like spiritual jujitsu with God. He takes all things and works them together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. That means all things. And so even the darkest moments, he will take that and turn to your ultimate good and to his great glory. And it won't often look as if that's happening. And when Jesus is dying on the cross, the Son of God says, By God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But that was Friday. And Sunday's coming. And Sunday's coming for you, too. There's hope. And that's the hope that you've been called to. And because you have hope, what are you released from? You are re released from a life of emptiness and a life of randomness. Life is not some random, empty, I don't know even what you would call it, journey, I guess, that you just sort of struggle through and try to crawl your way towards the end and then you die. And, you know, no one knows you died. No one really cares, you realize. Do you remember your great-grandfather's name? No, you don't. And don't worry. 
don't feel bad. They're not going to remember your name either. <laughs> but I know someone who will because your name's written down in glory. <laughs> he knows your name. He knows the hair, every number of the hairs on your head. There's nothing he doesn't know. And you've been called to a hope. And that releases you from emptiness. The second thing you are released from is not only emptiness. You are released from performance. Do you see what he says? He says uh, in verse 18, the hope to which he has called you, what are what? The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Now that sounds like Bible language, doesn't it? Oh, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. No one knows what that means. Let me tell you what that means. I'll put it in the words of the psalmist. And you don't quote this enough. So I want you to remember this one, all right? You're writing it down? I see everything. <laughs> you know, some of you guys, it's like you're watching TV. You don't think I can see you back like on the TV, you know? <laughs> I have the best seat in the house. <laughs> I see it. Psalm 18, what's the psalmist say? He rescued me. He rescued me. Why? Because he delighted in me. He rescued me because he delighted in me. And that's what a lot of Christians don't understand. You think that you are rescued by your performance. You're like, if I'm a really good person, and I mind my P's and Q's, and granted no one's perfect, but if I work really hard, perform well, do everything I'm supposed to do, be a reasonably good person, then Based on those credentials, I can now offer them to God and he'll accept me into heaven. That is most people's idea of Christianity. I've got great news for you this morning. That's not Christianity. That's another religion. That has nothing to do with Christianity. This is what Christianity says. If you've never heard it before, this is it. Jesus Christ knows that we cannot be good. There's none righteous, no, not one. None of us are perfect. It's worse than that. None of us have no shot at perfection. You're not even in the ballpark. You can't see it from where you're standing. It's not available. But God, the second eternal person of the Trinity, God the Son, took on human flesh, and he came and he lived the life of the perfect law of God for you. And then goes to Calvary and accepts the punishment that is the just reward of those who are not perfect. Those who are not perfect, what? The wages of sin is death. And so he has to die to conquer death. It's not some sort of blood sport. Come on, get your head out of the sand. He comes to conquer death, and of course they dish out the worst, worst death possible to him, because wouldn't that be the way it works? And then Jesus Christ rises from the dead to conquer death for you and then gives all of that to you as a gift. It's grace. It's mercy. God does not require your performance. The performance that you need was already done for you by Christ. He performed for you. He obeyed for you. He gives uh, his perfect obedience to you is a gift. When the Father looks at you, all he sees is the perfect obedience of Christ. Hard to believe, isn't it? He rescued you because he loved you. He rescued you because he delights in you. He has a picture of you in his wallet. <laughs> you see, you see, John? He's doing great. All straight A's in school. He just got accepted to Harvard Law. It's going to be great. He loves you. He delights in you. And because he delighted in you, he rescued you himself. He didn't leave you to yourself. Because we know how that would work. And, you know, everybody who disagrees with that, I say, real simple. Can you conquer death? How good are you with that? Oh, and by the way, tell me when that's going to happen. Hmm? How good are you at fighting carcinogens on your own? Uh, come on. 
You need someone to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. So we're released from performance. And so we now have an expanded awareness, not only that the world is not some sort of empty, random place, but we are guided by the purposes of a God who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Because that's true, we now have an expanded awareness of the comprehensiveness of grace. That's the problem with current evangelical Christianity. It drives me crazy. They've turned the grace of God and salvation into some sort of privatized therapeutic event where I just get to be better all by myself. And of course, you know, scholars know this and they've written books about it. Nathan Hatch wrote a great book called The Democratization of American Christianity. Precisely what he's talking about. God, in his great purposes, has a cosmic plan. And that cosmic plan was to return his creation to its former perfection and to include in that all of those people who are his. It's not just you and Jesus. Do you understand why the Bible says even the trees of the forest will clap their hands? Because God is going to restore his entire creation. And what you are, believe it or not, is you, as the people of God, are God's inheritance. Jesus Christ earned you. You know how you get an inheritance, right? Someone's going to die for an inheritance. You, you recognize that? Uh, if you get the money before they died, you either stole it or, you know, they gave it to you. An inheritance. Someone's going to die. And because Christ died for you, he inherits you. And so you are the people of God, the people of his inheritance. And the plan of God from all eternity is that when Christ would come and restore, that's what redemption means, recreate a new humanity. Old things would pass away, all things would become new. And it's not merely that God comes to get you. Yes, it's personal. It's you. But it's not private. It's personal, but it's not private. It's not just you and Jesus. That means that you are part of his great cosmic plan. And because that's true, you don't have to perform anymore for Jesus. You don't have to perform anymore for God. You can rest in his grace, rest in his mercy, rest in the plan that he has for his creation, and know that he is the God who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That gives you a release from performance. You are released from emptiness. You have a plan and a purpose that you participate in the cosmic plan of God. And you do not have to perform anymore. By grace are you saved through faith in that, not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Finally, not only are you released from emptiness, not only are you released from performance, but you are released from worry. You see what the issue is here? He says, number one, the hope to which he has called you. And then he prays, number two, for the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. You are the inheritance of God. But not only that, he prays for something else that you fail to have an awareness of. The immeasurable greatness of his power towards us. The immeasurable greatness of his power towards us. In other words, what Paul is praying for the Ephesian church is that they will have a greater awareness of the power of God. And that's precisely in your darkest moments, the awareness that you need most. Because it looks for all the world, I know, as if every other power is winning. Which is precisely what it looked like on the cross. It looks like the carcinogens are winning. It looks like the divorce lawyer is winning. It looks like the kids who don't like you anymore. It looks like they're winning. It looks as if the depression is winning. It always looks like whatever is happening in your life is more powerful than the immeasurable powerfulness of God. It always looks that way. But we're united to Christ in his death and in his resurrection. And resurrections don't come without death. Do they? They don't. And so we're called 
to understand that tribulation works patience and patience works experience and experience works hope. And because that's true, we can be released from worry. We can do what Jesus said. How was it possible for Jesus to say, be anxious for nothing? Didn't he read Freud? The reason that Jesus could say, be anxious for nothing, is because everything that gives you anxiety is what happens when you give power to everything except your Creator. And when you give that power, it will control your life. But what Paul prays is that they will understand the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us. In other words, it's not mindless power. It's not abstract power. It's not power in principle. It's power exercised towards you. How do you receive that power? You receive that power because he has rescued you from sin and death and the curse of sin and death. He has indwelt you with your, uh, his spirit and you now have eternal life. And because you have eternal life, you can know that no matter what is happening in this moment, this moment is not the final moment. This moment is not the lens by which you read everything in your life. This moment is merely a taste of something that is passing away. This world shall pass away. But I am telling you that the God who has immeasurable power, he is giving you incalculable benefits now. And what most of us pray for is just get me a new parking space. <laughs> I'll know Jesus loves me if I never catch a cold and if everybody loves me. Did everybody love Jesus? Was he living the healthy life on the cross? How was that? Was everybody nice to him? No. But that's not the point. The point is his immeasurable power that he directs towards us is a power that through his spirit will give you perseverance. That you can go through anything knowing that this world is not your home. This is temporary stop. And it's not that great a stop. It's a bus stop that's a little dirty, isn't it? Right? But you're not going to be here forever. This is not the destination. And because that's true, that's Paul's prayer. What is your real need? To have an expanded awareness of God. Not an expanded awareness of your circumstances. Not an expanded awareness of just being you. An expanded awareness of who God is. And who is God? He is the God who has willed all things according to his loving, kind, precious, wise purposes. And because that's true, you are relieved from emptiness in your life. What is the God? He is the God who delights in you. He rescued you because he delighted you. And that releases you from performance because Christ is performed on your behalf. You now have an expanded awareness of his grace, knowing that his grace and the riches of his glorious inheritance is in you. And not only that, you can have an expanded awareness of the power of God who works all things according to his pleasure and will to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. What kind of God does it take to fulfill that? You love that passage in Romans 8, don't you? But what's the precondition that he works all things to your good for them that love the Lord? Doesn't he have to be able to control all things to do that? He can't be guessing at it, can he? He can't be surprised by anything you do. That wouldn't fulfill that verse, would he? No, he's got to be the kind of God as what? Who works all things according to the counsel of his will. And that releases you from ultimate worry. You can know that you have a plan and purpose in the God who is a powerful, loving, gracious God. Let's take a moment now and pray to that God. Lord, this morning we are so thankful for what you have done for us in Christ. I pray that we will remember that you are the God uh, who knows all things, cares for us nevertheless, and has rescued us because you delighted in us. I pray these things for Christ's sake. Amen. Welcome to the table of the Lord.